Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? This week, I want to talk about three of the most famous eponymous laws in information technology. Eponymous, uh, by the way, that just means it's named after a person. And there's a thing called Stigler's Law of Eponymy, which uh, says most discoveries aren't actually named after the people who discovered them. It was proposed by Stephen Stigler, who was a professor of economics at the University of Chicago in 1980, but it was actually discovered by somebody else, a sociologist called Robert K. Merton. But uh, Stigler had to name it after himself, otherwise his law wouldn't work. <laughs> Now, uh, the eponymous laws that I want to talk about here are Moore's Law, Amdahl's Law, and Conway's Law, because I think those three laws considered together lead to a really interesting conclusion about the way we design and build modern software systems. Let's start with Moore. Gordon Moore was the co-founder of Intel and Fairchild Semiconductor, and way back in 1965, Moore wrote a paper predicting that the number of components per integrated circuit would double every year. In 1975, he revised his forecast to doubling every two years, and his prediction was pretty much spot on. Nearly 50 years later, if you plot a logarithmic graph of the total transistor count of CPUs against the year they were introduced, you get something approximating a straight line. Now, here's the same graph, but this is the uh, average transistors per core. You see how around 2005, the two series suddenly diverge? That's because in the early 2000s, we began hitting the physical limit of how many transistors could be integrated into a single CPU. Around about the 4 gigahertz mark, we kind of hit a wall in terms of raw clock speed. And so the semiconductor industry hit upon the bright idea of multi-core CPUs, basically put in more than one CPU into the same package. Now that's had a profound impact on the way we create software. In the days before the web, computing power was about scaling up. You'd a bigger mainframe. Now it's about scaling out, spinning up dozens, maybe hundreds of instances of your back-end services so your system can handle more requests. Every year there are more people online. They use more devices and more apps to do more things, which means more data, more power, more computation. The only way to keep up is to build systems that can scale out to cope with that demand. Code needs to parallelize. We need to split our systems out into little autonomous units of work that we can distribute across as many cores as we have available and then combine the outputs of all those little operations into the result that our users expect. And that brings us to Amdahl's law. Gene Amdahl was the chief architect of the IBM System 360, and he first presented his eponymous law back in 1967. Amdahl's law is about the theoretical performance improvements we can expect by parallelizing some given workload. Uh, it's actually this equation here, but uh, I like to think of it in terms of Christmas dinner, or Thanksgiving dinner if that's your thing. If you have one person with one cooker working alone, it'll take 20 hours? to prepare Christmas dinner with all the trimmings. If you add more people with more cookers, you can parallelize this and so you can get it done faster. But if you want to eat at three, you still have to start by 11 a.m. because you can't roast a turkey in under four hours. Doesn't matter how many chefs and ovens you've got. And if another 20 people unexpectedly show up half an hour before lunch, well, now you have a problem. So instead of a turkey, let's serve traditional Christmas burritos because you can parallelize burritos. You spin up 20 more chefs and you can still be ready to everyone to eat at three o'clock. And that's the benefit of hosting in the cloud. You can spin up more resources really fast. But the whole point of Amdahl's law is that if your workload doesn't break down into small tasks that can happen in parallel, there's a limit to how much you can scale. If you want to go really fast, you've got to build systems without any turkeys in them. And that brings us to Conway's law. First published in 1964, Conway's Law is the observation that any organization that designs a system, defined broadly, will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Kind of like Moore's Law, it's an observation that has proved remarkably prescient over the last few decades. Anytime you have to deal with your bank and they transfer your call to another department and you've got to answer all the security questions again, you've just experienced Conway's Law. You've got two departments running two different software systems created by two different teams who didn't or who couldn't talk to each other, and so the software systems, they don't talk to each other either. So what's the Conway's Law equivalent of roasting a turkey? Well. Maybe it's a four-hour project update meeting where a bunch of people sit around and tell each other things they could have emailed or written down in a ticket or on a wiki page. Uh, maybe it's waiting for someone to reply to your email or to return your call because uh, they've asked you to build a dashboard 
They haven't told you what it needs to look like or where you can get the data from. Maybe it's just sitting on a train for two hours every day because the boss has decided, hey, everyone needs to get back into the office. One of the underlying principles of the Agile Manifesto is that the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. I think that's correct, but I think it might be optimizing for the wrong metric. Conversation is high bandwidth, high interaction discussion medium. It's brilliant at solving problems and terrible at capturing the solutions. Nobody outside that conversation knows what was said. And there's always a risk the people you're talking to, they nod and yeah, they tell you they get it when actually they haven't understood a single word you said. Really effective distributed teams, they optimize communication for discoverability, trade off a little temporary velocity for longer term efficiency. Think about the kinds of patterns that produce resilient distributed systems. Uh, autonomous microservices, command query separation. If you think about how the components in those systems communicate, uh, they're not constantly checking back with headquarters. They have all the information they need and you leave them to get on with it. Or think about infrastructure as code. You know, if you're running Terraform, Pulumi, Bicep, everything that you need to increase your system capacity, scripted, documented, repeatable, can you add more people to a team as easily as you can add more VMs into a cluster? Moore's Law says capacity doubles every two years, and for the last 20 years that's only been true thanks to multiple cores and distributed systems. Amdahl's Law says you want to take advantage of distributed computing, you should eliminate non-parallelizable tasks, and Conway's Law says if you don't want non-parallelizable tasks in your structure of your systems, you shouldn't have them in the structure of your teams. Or, you know, put it another way, meetings don't scale. Organizations that have a lot of meetings will create systems that don't scale, and if you want to win at the internet, that means you've got to stop having meetings. Now, this is some pretty old school thinking. Conway's law was 1964, Moore's law was 1965, Amdahl's law was 1967, and the tech industry generally isn't great at learning from our own history. We love new shiny things. Writing code is more fun than reading it. Inventing new stuff is more fun than studying old stuff. But these observations, they come straight out of one of the most audacious decades in engineering history. You know, the 1960s gave us the Apollo program, Boeing 747, Concorde, the Lockheed SR-71. We're talking about the kind of people that landed human beings on the moon using slide rules and number two pencils, you know? It's, uh, it's just possible that they were onto something. Folks, I hope you found that interesting. You'll take it easy out there, you look after each other, and uh, I'll see you next time.